Hey everyone, hope you're having a great day. I know it's been a while since I made a video, but like I said, just been busy. Stuff happens, life happens. But um, I will be returning back to the other series of videos where I was talking about the gospel. Uh, the next one was going to be the resurrection, but I wanted to go ahead and go ahead and knock out this video on universalism because I've had a lot of people for a while now been asking me for a video on this. And I uh, even had a person this week that pretty much told me that the arguments that universalism makes uh, is uh, very attractive to them. And they, they can't really help it, basically, is what the guy was saying, is he can't, he's uh, drawn to their arguments. Uh, it's, he's just, ha he, he finds it uh, fascinating to believe that in the end, everyone will be saved. And as of right now, it just sounds like the guy is actually a universalist. But um, this video is for him and for anyone else that's kind of teetering on the edge and you are really thinking about giving in and believing that belief. Um, and I know the way universalists frame their belief, it is like an attractive offer. It really is. It, it sounds, uh, it's, it's too good to be true but it sounds uh, amazing. It, it sounds like, wow, like, well, if that's true, I mean, you know, that's it now. I mean, what's the point? No need to preach the gospel anymore because, you know, everyone's going to be saved in the end. So, I mean, now your uh, evangelism stops. You're not giving the gospel anymore. Um, you can just chill because, I mean, what's the point of anything, right? Um, what's the point of even choosing to do good works for God. That doesn't matter because everyone's going to be saved in the end. Uh, your family members that chose to reject the gospel and may have died or, you know, the ones that they are alive that reject what you've been preaching to them, giving them the gospel. I mean, you're like, oh, well, it doesn't matter because they're going to be saved in the end. So it sounds attractive. It's like it's a, a cure for everything. That's what the belief is. Uh, but it's wrong. It's not true. And I'm going to show you that. But at first, I'm, I put on the board these verses right here. I'm just going to stand behind the camera for the next maybe five minutes just to make sure it doesn't cut out. Um, these verses, these one, two, three, four, five verses to show you. These are some of the verses I've heard that universalists use to uh, prove their belief. Um they, they swear up and down using those verses that you can prove uh, that everyone will be saved in the end. Now, there's different versions of universalism. You have, um, today I'll be kind of talking about like a hodgepodge of them. Like, I'm just kind of just throwing all different universalist beliefs out there. You have universal beliefs that believe that there is no hell and everyone's saved in the end. Then you have universalists believe that believe there is a hell, but you can get out of it. And then you even have a universal belief um, that uh, they think it's kind of their their belief is weird. I'm trying to remember what it was. Their belief doesn't even require that you have any knowledge of the Bible on, on any level at all. It doesn't matter. You're going to be saved in the end, and you'll be taught later on like somehow god is going to be like a schoolroom in heaven it sounds similar to mormonism or something but you'll be taught everything you need to know the point is everyone there's, there's still a version that says everyone's going to be saved in the end so if you have your bibles turn to psalm 106 verse 1 we'll start there Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, 
for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, this verse, I have heard people use this fact that God's mercy endureth forever, which I believe to be true. That's what the verse just said. But they will say, well, since God's mercy endureth forever, then going by the verse, God is having mercy on mankind forever. And they, which is still true, like the verse says, but they, they take it to an extreme, to the fact that, well, if God is truly, truly having mercy on mankind forever, then there's no way God could send someone to hell forever. Now, again, you got some versions that don't believe that there is a hell at all, so they don't think God is sending anyone anywhere. Except for to heaven. Everyone just goes to heaven in that version. But in the other version where people do go to hell that these universalists believe, they think God surely can't send you to hell forever because his God's mercy endures forever. So in their mind, it doesn't make any sense for you to be in hell while you still have God's mercy at the same time. So I've run into having many arguments with universalists, which... We're going to come to understand that the belief that people are in hell and did have mercy, and they didn't lose it when I'm saying have, they have it, had it, and still have it, but are in hell is all true. Same way we have people today that have grace right now. You don't have to believe to get it. It's, it's actually pretty sad to know that uh, I have learned that there are people um, that believe that you that think that you have to believe the gospel to get grace from God. It, it, it makes no sense at all. When we know there's a clear verse in the Bible. I, I don't have it right now, but um, I'll probably put it in the comment section. It tells about grace was given to all men, all of us. All mankind has been given grace. So it's crazy to me that there are people out there that think you must believe the gospel to obtain grace. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But um, neither did you have to believe the gospel to obtain mercy. Grace and mercy was given to you. You didn't have to do anything for it. Um, but it's there's group there's people out there, limited atonement groups, uh, various other mainstream modern Christianity groups that think you must have faith somehow uh, to have grace and mercy, but. It's not true. We all have grace and mercy right now, and I'll prove that to you using verses. But let's go to Romans 11, verse 32. Another verse that universalists use to try to prove their belief to be correct. Romans 11, verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Now, I will admit, the first time... All right, I'll stand in front of the camera. Okay, everybody. I will admit, the first time that I read Romans 11, verse 32, that I was somewhat confused by this verse. Let's read it again. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. When I heard that word might, to me, I translated it in my mind, like a maybe. He maybe will have mercy on them or maybe not. That is not correct at all. And even delving deeper, I had I went to, um, I compared what the Bible said uh, with the word might and what Webster's Dictionary said the word might was. And I looked up even instances in the Bible um, using the word might and I'm trying to think there was another word. I can't remember what it was. Possible. Because Webster Dic Dictionary was talking about might is talking about meaning something is possible. And I looked at the word possible in the Bible. And there was a verse. I can't recall it now. I think it was like with, with God, all things are possible. I think that may be the verse. And... I thought about what Webster's Dictionary was saying because Webster's Dictionary, using the word definition of possible, was actually saying that something being possible, meaning basically it 
can happen or it may not happen. While the Bible's definition of possible is not the same as that. Because I remember the verse, it said with, uh, I can't, I wish I could recall it, man. It was like a, a first part of that verse. I'll have to put it in the comment section. Put it this way, I'll have to just put it in there so you can see it. The part where it talks about with all things with God are possible. I'm paraphrasing that verse. Probably screwed it up. Is Webster trying to say that with God, some things are possible and some things are not possible? You see what I'm saying? Like, that's what, it didn't make any sense. So there's something fishy going on with the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, obviously. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary calls the word evil sin, in case you didn't realize that. Go to your Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, and it actually defines the word evil, right? It describes evil as sin or wickedness, and that's not it. The Bible says God creates evil. So is Webster saying that God creates sin and wickedness? Of course not. But we know sin means destruction. There's another verse that I did on a couple videos back that explained how uh, God sent an angel basically uh, to commit evil <laughs> against this uh, city. And it ended up, I can't remember the full everything that was going on, but point is what I got from that verse when I was reading it, it, it further described this evil that the angel was about to do and it was destruction. Evil is destruction. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. The Bible defines words for you. But why is Merriam-Webster uh, taking words and changing the definitions and meanings of them? So again, like a word possible or the word evil, it just changes the definition. So when you're looking at the Bible's definition of it and you look at Merriam-Webster's dictionary, you're like, what? What is this? The Bible says God creates evil. Man, Webster says evil is wickedness and sin. <laughs> so you can see how you get confused. So give me one second, guys. So, um, but that's a whole nother. I don't want to get off on a tangent on how Marion Webster changes definitions and meanings. And their definitions and meanings are not accurate at all. They've been changed. Maybe at one time they were accurate, but they've definitely been changed over time. So... Looking at Romans 11.32 again, I believe right here what this verse is saying is that God does indeed have mercy upon all. It's not a situation where he might, may be, might is not meaning in the sense like he may be have mercy on all or he may not have mercy on all. It's not what it's saying. God has mercy upon all. The saved and the unsaved. Everyone has mercy today. Some people, you, you guys in the comment section might disagree with me. I don't see how you could, but if you actually look at the verse, um, let's read it one more time. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. But the universalist, even though I agree with them that this verse means all unbelievers have mercy, it is not a verse that means that all will be saved. So again, the universalists believe that since God has mercy upon all and they, God will have mer his, his mercy endureth forever. So meaning he will have mercy upon all forever. So in their mind, they're saying, well, there's no way God can keep people in hell forever. That doesn't make any sense. How can you be in hell forever when you have God's mercy upon you forever? But... Again, I'm going down the line like this because I'm going to go on the other side. These are verses that are going to counteract all these verses that I'm reading right now. But if I, if I just go boom, 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 which is what I'm about to do right now, you can see why somebody will start to think in their head, the universalists are right. God has his mercy endures forever. His mercy is upon all. All right. So, yeah, this seems correct. That's, it seems correct. But it's not. That's what I'm trying to talk about today. Guys, give me one more second. Give me uh, one second. <clears throat> so, next we're going to go to, hopefully I can do this, finish this all. Acts 3 verse 21.
whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So this is one of their big verses that they use. That phrase, restitution of all things. So it's, it's exactly as it says. But what are the all things? Now the universalists, ignoring scripture, other verses I'm going to read to you, they say, doesn't matter, this verse proves God will restore all things, which he will. I'm not disagreeing with them, but I'm disagreeing with what they're definite, what do they think all things is. Various universalist groups have different things. There are some universalist group that think even Satan is included in that. They think even Satan himself is included in the all things. So they think everything that you can, everything, everything in existence. All right, that's what they're thinking. They think, let me go right back to that verse again. Uh, what's the loss? Here it is. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So in their mind, like I said, it's just everything in existence. Everything. If it exists, restitution. They're, they're going to, um, that's what's going to occur. So I disagree with that, though. Because Satan will not be uh, restored. There will not be a restitution of those such as Satan who is destined to burn in hell for all eternity or those that end up in hell. And hell, of course, will one day be thrown into the lake of fire. Those people will not be restored. Uh, there will not, not be a restitution of them. Even though there are people that say, nope, they're included. Hell as well. Hell, the lake of fire, they're included. God, those are the all things that restitution, that, that it's going to be made for them too. It's not going to be made. But that's what they believe. So they're not going to be restored. They're not going to be saved. People burning in hell, they're not going to be saved out of there. Uh, those that end up in the lake of fire, they're, <laughs> they're not going to be saved out of the lake of fire. Uh, the devil is not getting out of the lake of fire. But there's universalists that believe that. That is the verse that they use. Uh, let's go to 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. And what you'll come to understand is that universalists, most of the groups, strangely agree. If you've someone that's been watching my channel, and you know what I believe in this channel, universal forgiveness. Universalists, many of them believe in universal forgiveness, but they don't think it is necessary to be believed. They're like, it's, to them, it's like, yeah, we got our forgiveness when Christ died on the cross. Big deal. That's In their head, they're just like, whatever. That doesn't matter. They're like, we're all going to be saved. But you ask them, why are we all going to be saved? Verses like this. That's what they're going to use on you. They're going to say, oh, restitution of all things. And in their mind, translation, God will save everyone. Or this verse that I'm about to read, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth? So now imagine you're someone that doesn't know how to rightly divide a word of truth, but they're, they're reading the Bible, they're searching, and some universalist takes them by the hand and says, Hey, brother, let me show you all this. So they're just taking them point by point by point. You can see how that will build up in that person's mind. Oh, I see. I see. Everyone's going to be saved. And they say, of course, especially this verse, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. See, see, God has a plan that all men will be saved. See, it says it right here. You can't argue with scripture, not can you? Who will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. How are you going to argue with that? Yeah, you're right. That does sound correct. I mean, looks like God is going to have all men to be saved. Wrong. Wrong go. This verse 
is talking about God's will, his desire. He has a desire. He wants all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. God doesn't get what he wants. Do you understand that? God does not always get what he wants. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. The universalist takes this verse and says God is going to get what he wants and he himself is going to make it a reality. He's going to save all men. It's not what the verse is saying. Look at the first word. Who? <laughs> Who will have all men to be saved? Who will? Who will? This is what he wants. This is his desire. He wants all men to be saved. But that don't mean it's going to come true. We know it's not going to come true. There are people in hell right now that will never be saved out of it. Universalist has to twist scripture and they'll take that verse and say, no, what it really means is he's going to exact his will. He's going to do it himself, Brandon, and he's going to make it a reality. He's going to save all mankind. So that's what they think. See what I'm saying? That's, that's what's going on in their head. Now, it's kind of one of those verses where you're going to come to a crossroads. That's it. I know people that have become universalists simply off of this verse alone. Now, they might still be asking me questions because they're doubting a little bit, but they kind of feel safe in the universalist group because they feel like that verse is, is, a, is solid. See, who will have all men to be saying because knowledge is true. That, that, that's iron tight. You can't, it's airtight. You can't, uh, there's no way around that. God is going to make his will a reality. He's going to exercise it. And he's going to, all men will be saved. See, they twist. <laughs> they do. Never seen the verse as a desire. It's just God's desire. It's just what he wants. It's his will. It's what he wants to happen, but it's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen because there's other verses over here that counteract that. Counteract. These verses counteract things that these verses are saying. Now, not now. let me say this when I say counteract. Not counteracting the, the universalist belief, okay? Not directly counteracting, but I'm saying what the universalist believes about these verses, these verses counteract their ideas about those verses. I hope you understand that. So let's go to Genesis 12, verse 3. Another universalist verse that they use to justify their belief. And I will say the universalists are growing. They're growing. Uh, they're getting pretty big. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. There you go, Brandon. That's it. All families of the earth will be blessed. There you go. I mean, what do you not understand about that verse, Brandon? Well, I know that verse does not mean exactly what you think it is. Because, I mean, people burning in hell doesn't sound like a blessing to me. So, uh, so is the verse saying that all families will be blessed as in like, Hey, if you're burning in hell, you're still counted in that, and you're a family, and whatever you're being blessed while your you know your flesh is burning off your bones. Is that what it means? I don't think that's what it means. So, universalists use that verse. Now, personally, I believe where it says, let's look at it one more time, Genesis twelve verse three, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth. Be blessed. Now, is this something that is transdispensational, meaning across all dispensations, all families on this earth will be blessed? Impossible. Completely impossible. It's just common sense. And again, I have, I'm going to show you these verses that directly go against that idea because there are families that have not been blessed. There are families that have been destroyed. There are families of human of people that are burning in hell. That is not a blessing. It's not a blessing if a whole family goes to hell. So again, this can't be a, a trans-dispensational verse. 
This can only be in a certain period of time where all families will, on the earth will be blessed. That is what I believe. Now, you can argue with me and you can say, well, I have a different idea on that verse. That's fine. I don't think it's trans dispensation. I don't think every family across all dispensations has been blessed. No, I completely disagree with that. You say, well, you're going against the Bible. I don't believe I am going against the Bible. I'm going against your belief of it. I don't think that's what it is. I don't think all families across all dispensations have been blessed. In every dispensation, every family coming from Abraham has been blessed. Now, right now, there's no Jews. There's no nation of Israel. So we know that, again, you see how there is so many holes in their belief. There's no nation of Israel today. Didn't the verse just say, in thee, in Abraham? Is anyone a part of the family of Abraham today? No. There's no nation of Israel. Therefore, already that idea that it's transdispensational is wrong. In the dispensation of grace, there is no family connected back to Abraham that is alive today being blessed. There is no nation of Israel today. There is no nation of Israel today. Yes, I know there's a place over in the Middle East called Israel. And those people on it call themselves Jews. That is not God's nation of Israel. There is no nation of Israel recognized by God. That's just the way it is. So again, okay, we're still going. There is no, let's look at Genesis 12 verse 3 again. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Can't be applying to today. Impossible to be applied to today. So what does this mean? There's a period of time in which that's going to, sounds like a dispensation. It's going to happen in a dispensation in the future. Okay? In the future. Not right now. That's what you have to understand. Unless we are going to conclude that this verse God has already accomplished what this verse is saying in the past already. I don't believe he has. I believe it is something that will happen in the future, not today. But the universalist thinks that verse applies today. They think families of the earth today are being blessed. Again, how are they being blessed when there are families burning in hell? Common sense Common sense, use your, use your brain, use your brain matter. Think about it. Families are suffering today. They're not being blessed. <laughs> but again, the universalist, the brainwashed universalist ignores that. They're going to ignore the verses I'm about to show you on this side now. Romans chapter 1, 16 through 17. <clears throat> For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. What happens if you don't believeth in that verse? What happens if you don't believeth? You don't get salvation. If you don't believe, you don't get salvation, which completely goes against universalism. Universalism says belief is not required, all will be saved. While the verse that you just saw says, uh, let's read it again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, for it, it, not you. All right? Not what Rodney Bailalu says, KFC man, not him, not Rod Bell, or anybody else that believes in these universalist garbage. No, it. It, the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. If you don't believeth, you don't get salvation. That's just it. You don't get it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This one verse goes against everything I just read over here. Their ideas about these verses. 
them thinking that each one of these verses is a universally strong point of, you know, like, this proves our belief. This one verse goes against all of it. Okay? You can't say, well, all right, well, God's mercy endureth forever. So because his mercy endureth forever, all will be saved. Wrong. You got to believe the gospel. You got to believe it to get salvation. Counteracts that. All right, well, over here, um, well, God's mercy is upon all. Since God's mercy is upon all, uh, there's no way you can go to hell. Or because God's mercy is upon all and you happen to be in hell, God's going to get you out. You're going to get saved. You're going to get salvation out of hell. Wrong. Only those that believe it get salvation. I, I can just do this for each one. Each one. So, even here, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, talking about God's will. Who will have all men to be saved to now, to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire. We already know, looking at this verse again, Hey, God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But what happens if you don't believe it? You don't get salvation. Is that possible? Are there people that have not believed it and have not got salvation? Of course. Therefore, already, God's not getting what he wants. Because even one person, because he said all, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. If one person is in hell, and they are. There's many people there. But even if there was just one, this invalidates that this idea that God will make this happen. It invalidates it. All right? This verse right here, if you had that one God that didn't believe it, he didn't get salvation, well, how come God didn't have the power to save that guy? If his will, which we know is his will that all men to be saved, but let's go with the universalist idea. It's in their mind, it's his will, and he acts upon his will. He's saying the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Paul is telling you the gospel is, is Paul wrong? No. He's doing what God told him to do. He's speaking the words God told him to speak. This isn't Paul's uh, opinion. <laughs> okay? He's been moved by God to say this. This is coming from God. The man's speaking, Paul the man is speaking, but it's coming. These, this information is from God. So what is God telling you? He's telling you the gospel of Christ is the power of God, him, God, to salvation to everyone that believeth. You only get salvation if you believeth that gospel. If you believe it. Therefore, the universalist ideal, this verse is wrong. God is not going to forcefully save everyone against their will and make his will a reality. No, he's not. That's just his desire. It is his will that he wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It's just a desire. It's all it is. God is not saying, I'm going to make this a reality and I'm going to make sure every single man is saved. Nope. It's just his desire. He, will, he wants all men to be saying come to the knowledge of the truth. But, he, I mean, if he was saying, I'm going to make this a reality, then God has failed. <laughs> he's failed. You're making God a failure by saying he said he was going to make that a reality. He's failed. There's people in hell right now. Let's go to another verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 8 through 9. And God is not a failure, but the universalist belief, whether they understand it or not, they are making God to be a failure in their belief system. Because there are people in hell right now. Jesus Christ himself gave examples. The rich man and the poor man. Rich man's in hell. Did he believe the gospel for his dispensation? He wasn't in dispensation of grace. He was in dispensation of the kingdom, the past dispensation. Did the rich man do what God told him to do in that dispensation to get saved? Apparently not, because he's in hell, because Jesus Christ is telling them about the rich man. It's a real account. It's not a fable. It's not a, a, a mythology. It's real, a real account of a rich man burning in hell. But you just said, Universalist, that God says he's going to make it a reality. He's going to make sure everyone is saved. Now, some Universalists, they move it. They'll say, well, Brandon, what I really meant was... God will save everyone out of hell. I want to show you how that's false too. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. And 
And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Uh, no, I don't think this is it. Second vessel. I don't think this is the one I'm looking for. Yeah, this is not it. I was looking for something else. Man. It's the verse where it talks about inflaming fire. But I'm having a hard time finding it right now. That's right. I'll put it down in the comment section. I can't find it right now. I don't know why I can't find this verse. Um, let me see. Yeah, this is not it. I'll find the verse and I'll put it down. I can't locate it. This is a verse talking about inflaming fire, but I'll put it down there. I was going to use that. Uh, let's go to Revelation 14, verse 11. Let's hopefully, this is the right verse I found. Revelation 14, verse 11. Here we go. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And of course, universalists hates the words forever and ever. They hate it. Because in their mind, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Forever to them just means three minutes. Literally, I heard Rob Bell, this guy literally tried to say, he didn't say three minutes, but he it was a... Uh, interview or whatever he was talking about the Hebrew word uh, that he said is olam or something I'm trying to remember what he was talking about he said well uh, how long was Jonah inside the whale and you know and, and they said he used the word olam which they say in Hebrew that's not Hebrew that's not the real Hebrew language today but you know you can keep thinking it is Hebrew the actual Hebrew language was dead for 1400 years but this new Hebrew is so accurate, right? But the guy said that Hebrew in the Hebrew scriptures or whatever, the Hebrew Bible, whatever he had, where Olam was there. And it meant forever. So it's like the word has changed. Another situation where the meaning of a word has changed. Jonah was in the, the well forever. You see what I'm saying? So he's saying, well, what does forever mean? What does God mean in Revelation 14, 11? Let's read it again. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. So you have a, you have universalists that say, oh, dude, man, that just means the same time Jonah was in the well, bro. That's what it means. Could be like, you know, a couple of days. Could be three minutes. Who knows? They have no, have no understanding of what the word forever means. What does it mean in the English? What? Blasphemy. I will not read the word forever in English. Ew. <laughs> I mean, that's their idea. They don't want to look at it. They're like, oh, no, English, uh-uh. Give, give me some Hebrew. Give me some of that modern Hebrew that you created. <laughs> that's what they want. They don't want to, you know, they don't even want to go back to the Greek word for that. They don't want to hear any of that. They'd rather just, ah, give me that Hebrew word. I, I like that word, ola. That's what they want. But no, we know what forever means. You understand it. Look at examples of forever. All right. Uh, and the, that's why I wanted to find that other verse where it said in flaming fire, because in that verse, it said it was it had the word everlasting in that verse. I was going to show you that everlasting. So forever, meaning without end, forever and ever. I mean, it's, it's right here. Again, let's read it one more time. <clears throat> <clears throat> and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So he's telling you right that he even goes into further detail. They have no rest, day nor night. They have, the the universal says, nah, that just means for like maybe a week, bro. So you see what I'm saying? These people, you they change words. They change words, and it's it's hard to really talk to them about the Bible because words like forever and ever, they're going to change it. While you might believe common sense, you're going to say, yeah, this means without end. 
everlasting. It's, it's never going to end. It's going to keep going on and on and on and on and on forever. Like some people even try to use like, I heard one guy tried to connect this. This will be it and I'll be ending this video. Yeah, this is getting long. One guy actually tried to say, well, forever is like a time word. And see, God made time. So what happens when God removes time? See, see, so forever loses its power. So now forever doesn't mean anything because see, there's no time except for God has been God forever. He, God has no beginning and no end. How long has God been God? <laughs> like, that's what the question I'm asking you. Because God is God outside of time. And I know there's verses in the Bible that talk about God being God forever. His power and his majesty and his sovereign, everything is forever. See what I'm saying? Is that saying only until he ends time he's God? And when he ends time he's not God anymore? But that's the type of BS that universes come up with, people. They come up with stuff like that. The word forever is only connected to time. And when God ends time, now the word forever doesn't mean anything. So now God can let everybody out of hell. This is the type of logic that they use. That's the type of logic that they use. Oh, yeah, that makes sense to me right there. So any, you know, and people, they know this doesn't make any sense. But they want it so badly to be true. They want it so badly to be true. Even though I just read you verses in this one verse I couldn't find. I'll put it in the comment section. Verses that talk about people being tormented forever and ever. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. The universalist says, nah, that's not what you think. It's a mistranslation. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe the word of God. I'm holding my hands. They don't believe it. <laughs> like they, they, they allow mistranslation. We don't really have God's word. This is kind of more of a guidebook. <laughs> if it's more of a guidebook, why do you just have this belief of you? Oh, I forget. That's why you got to make your own books. Yeah. So if, the, if you're someone that wants to be universalist, just remember the universalists made their own book because they believe this is wrong. They believe the KJV 1769 is wrong. It's, it's invalid. It has. It's flawed. It's uh, mistranslations all over. So they had to create their own Bible. You still want to believe the universalist belief? When the universalists had to depart from this and make their own book to try to make their belief valid and logical? You can make, I can make anything logical. I can just write my own book and make anything logical in my world, in my imagination land. And that's what universals are doing. In their imaginary land, they're just making anything. They're justifying it in their head. They're just making it logical to them. And they don't care about what the Bible says. They don't care. They care about everlasting fire. That doesn't mean anything to them. All right, so I hope you got a lot out of this. Um, anybody else want me to do more uh, videos on universals? I'll do some more. I know there's some more verses I can talk about. The verses that I couldn't put up on the board that I forgot about, I'll put it in the comment section. But I hope this video helps you out. Have a great day.